Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 1, we shall begin our reading with the 26th verse. May we hear the inspired word of the living God. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Then behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And may God speak to our hearts and minds today through this his holy word. May his name ever be praised. Amen. Our subject this morning, the virgin birth, fact, or fable. Now I want to ensure, assure you right off that I do not believe in the virgin birth and hope that none of you does. Well now I've got your attention. Those words were spoken from the magnificent Riverside Church in New York City a half century or more ago by the Reverend Harry Emerson Fosdick, the leader and popularizer of the liberal theological movement in America. And they have echoed and re-echoed throughout liberal churches of this nation since and before. The virgin birth, I believe, is a fact, and not only a fact, but a foundational fact of our faith. There are the more deceptive kind of skeptics that will not so much as attack it directly, but will say it really doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. Some of you have no doubt sat in churches where you have heard that kind of statement. Having heard it myself, I one day sat down to consider what difference it does make. And here are the differences that I came up with. One, if Jesus were not born of a virgin, then the New Testament narratives are proven false and unreliable. Mary is stained with the sin of unchastity. She was, of course, betrothed to Joseph, which is more than our engagement by far. It required a bill of divorcement to end this betrothal, and should someone be found to have been unchaste, it was not fornication but adultery which they were guilty of, and the woman was taken to the gate of the city Her clothes were ripped, her jewelry removed, she was dressed in rags, tied with a rope, and all of the women were brought out to gape at her, lest they should be involved in such lewdness. Today, 
Such unchastity gets you an invitation to a talk show on morning TV. <clears throat> Three, Jesus was mistaken about his paternity because he repeatedly declared that he was the Son of God and that God was his Father. For Christ was not born of the seed of the woman, and therefore the ancient promise given in the Garden of Eden that the seed of the woman would destroy the head of the serpent is unfulfilled. Jesus was, therefore, an illegitimate child, not the peerless Son of God. He is consequently not the God-man. He was then a sinner just like the rest of us, and as a sinner, he cannot be the divine redeemer because the sacrifice must be perfect. Therefore, we have no savior at all. 10, we are yet in our sins and without forgiveness. 11, we have no hope after death. 12, there is no mediator between God and man. 13, there is no Trinity because there is no second person of the Trinity. 14, Christ should not have prayed, Father, forgive them, but rather, Father, forgive us, because he was a sinner just like the rest of us. And lastly, if this miracle of the virgin birth is denied, where shall we draw the line? Why should we not then deny them all? Well, why is it that people do so much deny this miracle of the New Testament, more than perhaps any other. And interestingly, one study showed that 56% of seminarians, those who are in process of being, becoming ministers, 56% do not believe in the virgin birth. Why is that? You just heard about the people that are teaching them, that's why. 60% of Methodist ministers don't believe it. 49% of Presbyterian ministers in the United Presbyterian Church don't believe it. 44% of Episcopalian ministers don't believe it. And on and on it goes. Finally, if you got all the way down, I think you would find the PCA, Presbyterian Church in America, of which we are a part, that you would find 0% of our ministers disbelieve it. They all <clears throat> believe it, as does every true Christian. But why is it? Well, one of the basic reasons is a basic anti-supernatural bias, a naturalistic frame of mind that refuses to accept the miraculous at all. Now, quite evidently, if you don't believe in miracles, you don't believe in the virgin birth, which was clearly a miracle. Dr. Gutsky at seminary used to say that the virgin birth is no big problem at all for God. If there is a God who created the universe, if he flung the galaxies out from his fingertips, if he painted the night sky with a scintillating Milky Way, then surely for him to take a tiny seed and place it in the womb of a woman is nothing at all. Keep in mind that when God created the world, we're told in Genesis 1, that he placed that same kind of seed in every animal, in every fruit, in every tree, in every plant that exists on this planet, billions and trillions of them. Why should it be thought a thing impossible that God should simply place a Y chromosome in the womb of a woman to produce a child. It is an anti-supernatural bias. And Dr. Gutsky said that if you can't believe that God can do that little thing, you really don't believe in God at all. If he can't do that, he can't do much of anything. So you see that behind this lurks the gaping abyss of atheism. So there is the first, the anti-supernatural bias, which prevails in the hearts of many, even in the clergy and in the seminaries. Secondly, there is what is called the argument from silence. 
Now, the argument of silence was raised in an interesting encounter that took place between Dr. Rimmer, Dr. Harry Rimmer, a now deceased Presbyterian minister who had doctorates both in theology and science, an encounter that he had with an older minister on the floor of a presbytery. They were examining a young, rather radical theologue to be ordained when the young man said that he didn't believe in the virgin birth, which caused something of a furor in that presbytery. And then an older minister stood up and said, now, now, he said, let's not give this young man too hard a time and make a big deal over this. He said, because I too am one who does not accept the virgin birth. And someone said, why not? He said, very simple. It's only mentioned in two books of the Bible, Matthew and Luke. It doesn't appear at all in Mark or John, and Paul never mentions it, and therefore I don't believe it. At that point, Dr. Rimmer stood to his feet and said, well then, sir, what do you preach and teach? He said, oh, I preach the Sermon on the Mount. That's enough for anyone. To which Dr. Rimmer enjoined, well, it's not enough for me. He said, well, why not? He said, because I don't believe that Jesus ever preached it. And he said, for heaven's sake, why not? Dr. Rimmer replied, because it's only found in two Gospels, Matthew and Luke, the same two Gospels that mention the virgin birth of Christ. It's never mentioned by Mark, nor by John. Paul never refers to the Sermon on the Mount, and therefore I conclude that Jesus never preached it. How wonderful is the argument from silence. Well, the old minister was silenced by that retort, as should anybody who thinks clearly. So there is the anti-supernatural bias, there is the argument from silence, and the third reason that many reject it is, <clears throat> as it is well known, that there are stories of miraculous and virgin births that abound in various pagan religions and mythologies. And therefore they say that the biblical story of the virgin birth was taken from these earlier pagan mythologies and religions. To mention just a few, for example, it's long been known that Greek mythology teaches that Zeus, the Greek god, came into Alcmene and produced Hercules. Vishnu, in his eighth incarnation, or avatar, came out as the virgin-born Krishna. Buddha is supposed to have been born of his mother, Maya, in a virgin birth. Augustus Caesar and Alexander the Great both claimed to have had virgin births, as well as others. Therefore say these skeptics, it is quite clear that the story of the virgin birth of Christ was simply stolen from all of these pagan religions and is to be dumped in the same dust heap of history that all of the rest of them have fallen into. Well, not quite so fast. Let's look at it. First, Let's look at the quality of the stories. In the case of Zeus producing Hercules, you discover what you see all of the time among the Greek gods, and that is that these are simply men blown up large with all of their sins and foibles, cohabiting with human beings, and in this case, lying behind that, there was lust and lasciviousness in their desire for, for some fair mortal woman. And uh, in the case of Vishnu, he had first supposedly been incarnated as a fish, a turtle, a boar, and a lion, and other bizarre things. As to Buddha, his mother says that a six-tusked white elephant with red veins came into her side and produced him. In the case of Augustus Caesar, he claims that his mother, Olympias, uh, was impregnated by a snake, a serpent, as does, by the way, Alexander the Great make the same claim that his father was a snake. I don't think that's anything I'd want to boast about uh, if I were you. 
But what a difference between the chaste and the pure record of the virgin birth of Christ by the Holy Spirit than these depraved and bizarre stories in pagan religions. But let's put the axe at the root of the tree. The thrust of the argument is that these stories antedate the story of the virgin birth of Christ in Matthew and Luke, and therefore Matthew and Luke stole them from the earlier stories. But that is not the case. The fact of the matter is, is that you have the story of the virgin birth in the, gospel, in the book of Isaiah 714, where God says that he will give them a sign that behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a child, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, the fulfillment of which is described by Matthew. This was 700 years before, which antedates almost all of these stories, except for a few. But let's go back even farther. And we discover there the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel, which is that wondrous promise that was given by God to our first parents in Eden. You remember that only utopia that man has ever known, that glorious paradisical situation that God created for them when they had this marvelous relationship with their creator, with one another, and with their environment, and suddenly disaster fell. They sinned and disobeyed God, and their skies turned black, and their souls morose, and gloom hung over them like a pall. Sin had entered in like venom into the veins of the human race, <clears throat> and death by sin. But in the midst of that Stygian blackness, there appeared a single star, a star of prophetic hope, a star of promise. It is, as I said, the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel, where God said that the seed of the woman would destroy the head of the serpent, even though the serpent would wound the heel of the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman. In all the scriptures, there is no other person called the seed of a woman. Everyone is begotten by man. In the chronologies of Christ, we read how Abraham begat Isaac, who begat Jacob, who begat so-and-so, who begat David, who begat so-and-so, and so-and-so, -and -so, one man after another, until we finally read about Jacob, who begat Joseph, who was the husband of Mary, of whom feminine pronoun, was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. And so, in the long history of the human race, there is this single exception of Christ, the only one, not begotten by man, but the seed of the woman, whose father was God. And that promise was taken by our first parents and by their children and grandchildren, and it spread with them throughout the entire world. It was even written by God large in the stars. Some of you were here when I preached a whole series of messages on the true meaning of the zodiac and pointed out that all 12 of the signs of the zodiac are all taken from Genesis 3.15 the Proto-Evangelium. They're all pictures of the seed of the woman coming from Virgo, the virgin, who will destroy the head of the serpent, pictured in various different ways as, as a serpent, as a scorpion, as a dragon, all slain by the great heroes. But then in the time of the regnancy of Babylon, when polytheism spread throughout the pagan world, this was destroyed and perverted, distorted into the various pagan gods of antiquity, and the true meaning of that was lost. But God had written it large. The gospel was preached 
unto all of the world under heaven, even in the stars. And so that message was carried into all of the world and the pagan stories of virgin births and redeemers and so on were simply distorted recollections of the great truth that God revealed from the beginning in that proto-evangelium which antedates all of the pagan mythologies and myths. No, the virgin birth was not stolen from any pagan mythology. Well, those are three reasons, the anti-supernatural bias, the argument from silence, the pagan mythologies that are used to get rid of the virgin birth. Why do we believe it? Well, a young man newly minted from a seminary where the Bible was believed was sent out to preach in a small country church. And these Scandinavian folk that lived around there uh, came to hear him. There was one old farmer who was a skeptic, something of a curmudgeon, that uh, didn't come to church at all, but the young man wanted to win him, and he invited him to come to church one day, offered to pick him up and drive him, which he did, and he preached that morning on the virgin birth. And on the way home, he said to the old farmer, well, a dangerous question for a preacher to ask, what did you think of the sermon? And Mr. Worldly Wise of the Sod said, well now, son, if some girl today got herself pregnant, had a baby, and then told you that it was a virgin birth, would you believe that? I want to ask you, would you believe that? The young man pondered for a little while and said, well, he said, yes, I would if that baby grew up to live like Christ. You see, science demands that every effect have a sufficient and adequate cause. And in a world where everyone has sinned, where there are none righteous, no, not one, where the heart is deceitful above all things, and the front pages of our newspapers all over the world every day, morning and night, proclaim the sinfulness of man, the fall of mankind. Every front page of every newspaper every day declares that Genesis 3 is true. Man fell. Yet in the midst of that mud heap, there grows a single solitary lily, white and pure. How do you explain it? Every effect must have an adequate or sufficient cause. The only adequate cause is the fact of the virgin birth, that he did not inherit that venom of sin which has poisoned the human race. The uniqueness of Christ demands a unique birth. Secondly, I believe in the virgin birth because the scripture repeatedly and unequivocally declares it to be so. And that there are many arguments which I have presented to you in time gone by that make me believe that the scriptures are reliable and that they have evidenced themselves so to be. And therefore I can rely on them there as well. Thirdly, I believe the virgin birth to be true, which, by the way, is obviously something of a very subjective nature, a very personal, private matter at least, known ultimately only to Mary, beyond really the scientific investigations of the pebble droppers or anyone else. I believe the virgin birth is true because Christ rose from the dead. And that takes it out of the personal and private and puts it into the objective and the real and the public and the resurrection of Christ is the most 
firmly attested fact of antiquity, and therefore all of the evidence for the resurrection of Christ is evidence for the virgin birth of Jesus. Why? Because the scripture tells us that when God raised him from the dead, he put his imprimatur upon the atonement of Jesus Christ and declared that that sacrifice had been accepted and the sacrifice would not have been accepted if Christ were not pure. And he would not have been pure if he were born a sinner like all of us. Lastly, I believe and I call to the stand the only person who has personal knowledge of the issue, Mary herself. Now, if Jesus were not born of a virgin, it's quite clear she was that he was not born of Joseph, then she was an immoral woman, even as Hitler and others have declared. And they have speculated that uh, Jesus' father was a German soldier on duty in Palestine. They've even given him a name, Panthera. Repeated by the Talmud. If that were true, there's one person who would have known it, and that was Mary, his mother, who loved him, his mother who watched him when he was brought back onto the stairs of Pontius Pilate after his scourging, dripping blood crowned with thorns, who watched him drag that heavy cross through the Via Dolorosa, watched him crash to the ground under the weight of it time and time again, watched him as they reached the top of that ghastly hill of Golgotha, watched him as the soldiers threw him cruelly onto his back onto that cross, watched him as a soldier pulled a huge spike out of his pocket, watched him as he took the heavy hammer to drive it into his hand, and Mary would have stopped it right then. Oh yes, it would have ruined her reputation. But by one word, she could have ended that ghastly scene. Stop! I'll tell you the name of his father. Why was he crucified? Because thou, being a man, makest thyself God. For he claimed that God was his father. No, his name was Panthera. Yes, I'm guilty. I did it. I am ashamed. I confess it. But stop this horror. Mary could have and would have as any mother would, have ended it right there, except that she knew who his father was, and that his father was God. May we pray. O thou generator of Christ, Holy Spirit, regenerate us. If there be any here in whose hearts Christ has not yet been born, may he be born in them this day. May they say, O Christ, O God, I confess, I confess that I did it. I am guilty. I 
am a sinner. I have violated your law. It was for me that the spikes were driven, that the scourge was wielded, that the death pangs came. Come and wash me with his blood, cleanse me with his spirit, and quicken me now and forevermore. In thy name, amen. This has been a production of Truth in Action Ministries.